to the question you had about the conscription and volunteerism and all that. What proportion of all these people do you suppose were pressed into the army, compulsory service? Today we would call it being drafted during the 18th century. That had a very different meaning. So we've got all these soldiers. What proportion, let me step back a sec. When the war in America began in 1775, there were already British soldiers in America. Why? Because it was a British colony, right? So there were a bunch of soldiers here already, and it was an army, a peacetime army, and all of a sudden a war breaks out. What proportion of the men do you think are going to be conscripts in this army during peacetime? 90%. Yeah, 1 or 2% punishment for something. 2% punishment for something? Interesting. It's a trick question because the answer is actually 0%. It was not legal to press or force men to serve in the British Army during this time period. Oh, they were not allowed to do it. The Navy was a whole different story. But the oh. Army could not press men, conscript men, coerce men, anything else. Even those guys you hear about who were convicts or were in some kind of legal trouble could not be forced into the Army. They could give them the choice of a jail term or military service and some chose the military service, and even there it was up to the army whether they accepted these men or not, because not being a bunch of complete idiots, the army didn't want a bunch of criminals any more than society didn't want a bunch of criminals. You know, but there are guys who are in, um, who have been charged with minor crimes. Well, this guy stole some chickens. Why did he do it? Well, he couldn't get a job. He put, this doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be a threat to society. So that the kind of men who were given the choice of military service, they were not the murderers and the highway robbers and whatnot. They were the petty criminals where the magistrate says, you know, this guy's got a chance here. He's just had some bad things going on in his life. Maybe he can make some good if he's in the army instead of going to prison. Now, that kind of choice didn't end in the 18th century, right? You know, you hear about the judge, the guy saying, you know, son, you're in a heap of trouble, <laughs> but I'm going to give you a choice. <laughs> this kind of thing isn't unknown. Um, and we shouldn't get the impression that because it was possible to, for somebody to get a choice of going to the army or going to jail, that therefore everybody who was in the army had been a criminal. Right, that was in was a very tiny proportion. So we have no conscripts in the army at the beginning of the war. Now there's a war going on. We need to increase the size of the army. This rebellion in America is turning out to be a really big thing. We have to send lots and lots of soldiers over there. So it comes to 1778 now. We've sent a lot of new soldiers to America. What's the proportion of conscripts in the army now? 100 men of the 54th Regiment get off right down the beach here. How many of them are conscripts? 3,500 men in Rhode Island. How many are conscripts? Did they change their voice? It's still zero. Yeah, it's still zero because it's still not legal to conscript anybody in the army. That law didn't change. Now, the law did change in 1778 in May in Great Britain. So this has no relevance to the garrison here in Rhode Island yet because it takes a while for things to happen. But in May of 1778, a new law was passed that says you can conscript men under very, very specific circumstances, only in certain places in Great Britain, and you can script them only if they fit very specific parameters and whatnot. And then in 1779, that law was modified a little bit. And then in 1780, the law was repealed. And you couldn't conscript men anymore. It was repealed because it was a disaster. There were two populations of people that hated this whole thing about conscription. It, it just went really terribly. One population of people who hated conscription was the people who were liable to be conscripted, right? And it's not very popular with them. Yeah, it was the army. <laughs> They've got an army that is built on this idea of volunteer career soldiers, and all of a sudden you're going to say, hey, this new guy we're putting in the ranks to serve next to you doesn't want to be here. <laughs> How well do you think that's going to go over with your career soldiers? It was awful. So it was a disaster. By 1781, the proportion of conscripts serving in the American Revolution was less than 1%. So conscripts did come over here a little bit, but not enough to really have a significant impact in the army. And boy, do a lot of history books get this all wrong. There's this assumption that because a conscription law called the Press Act existed, that it must have been a prevalent thing, and people don't look at the details of what the law was and when it went fact what the real impact was. No, you said the Navy, they could 
The Take na- them. The Navy could press people. Ah. And the whole point of pressing sailors was not to just say you could go anywhere and drag anybody you wanted, but the whole nature of being a sailor, a civilian sailor, was that most sailors were freelancers. You go down, you sign on to a ship for a cruise. Okay. You go on the cruise, the cruise is done, you get home, now you're back on shore and you wait for as long as you want until you need a job again, you sign on to another ship. Pressing was a way that the Navy could go into a port town where there were liable to be a lot of sailors yeah. who were not working and say, we need you more than... I guarantee than... that they have some of them. And, Well, yeah, and you say it was a guarantee. Well, it was still forcing the people to serve in the Navy, yeah. whether they elected or not. But they weren't just going out and dragging anybody into the Navy. They, they, were, were, looking for, for yeah, they were looking for seamen who were not working <laughs> at that time. And in a time of a national emergency or national need, it's okay. Before. But that was the need. And again, I don't have statistics on that. It's no, not what I study, totally but, it, but yeah, it's a whole different thing than the Army. Let's get on to experience now. We're 450 men in the 22nd Regiment. I said that these guys are career soldiers. So by 1778, we have a mixture of relatively new soldiers and experienced soldiers. Um, out of 450, we've got about a third of them who have two years or less experience in the Army. That's a pretty big proportion compared to usually, and it's that way because a war has broken out and we need a lot of new men. We still have a substantial portion with far more experience in the Army. About two-thirds of them have at least three to five years. About half of them have six or more years in the army. Overall, it's a pretty experienced bunch of guys. These are not, again, a bunch of new recruits or raw soldiers who don't, who, who haven't been in uniform for a long period of time. So did that have something to do with attrition, being, people being pumped up? Um, you know, the, the, the high proportion of people with going Yeah, it absolutely did with wartime attrition. Now, people being bumped off, it wasn't mostly battle casualties. It was losing people due to illness, due to accidents during transportation, all sorts of different reasons. And it was also largely due to the fact that once the war broke out, the size of the regiments was increased. So it did a lot of recruiting. The size of a British regiment went from about 400, uh, about 350 private soldiers to about 500 private soldiers in a given regiment. So we go to a war footing, we had it. Slightly different. Was that the normal attrition? About 100, the percentages were there about? No, it was not the normal attrition. It was primarily due to the fact that they increased the size of the regiment. So we said we were now doing a 50% increase in how many men makes up a regiment. So a whole bunch of those people are new recruits. And some attrition is part of it, but then the normal peacetime attrition is gonna be 25 to 30 men a year, wartime attrition close to 50, 50 to 75 a year, year over year. But again, so two years of attrition can still give you figures like that. The point is well taken, but no, it's mostly because they make the regiment bigger. Let's get into trades. Now, I threw in a little thing earlier that may have gone unnoticed where I said that most British soldiers recruited around the age of, most British soldiers enlisted around the age of, what age did I say? 20? Yeah, I said around 20 years old. Well, if you're a young man in Great Britain, you start going to school. Most people went to school in Great Britain for at least a few years. But you finish school at around the age of 12. You don't join the army until you're on the age of 20. So what do you do in the meantime? You go to work, son. That's what you do. Almost all the soldiers who served in the British Army had done some kind of work, at least for a while, before they joined the army, which turned out to be a fairly interesting thing. Now, some of them actually pursued trades and apprenticeships or what have you. And if you think, okay, man, he's 12 years old. He gets an actual bona fide apprenticeship, which is usually how long? Four, four years, isn't it? Yeah, seven. So it's a typical time. So you apprentice yourself to a tailor for seven years. You finish, you're about 19. You find you absolutely hate this job. You're apprenticed to. So you join the army around the age of 20. A lot of people did this. Others bounced around from job to job and trade to trade. And it's one British soldier I particularly like who 
went into the coal mines at the age of seven. <laughs> By the time he was 15, he had quite enough of coal mining, and he joined the army. <laughs> so it varied person to person, but the army benefited from having people with skills in the ranks. So in the 22nd Regiment, during the entire American Revolution, now the war was eight years long, and this regiment was in America almost the entire time, about 1,005 men served in the regiment, at least for some amount of time, during this eight year period. The regiment on average had only 500 men in their given time, right? But there's a lot of turnover. Of those 1,005 men, I know the trades of about 330 of them. And of those, we have about 149 laborers, which works out to 49%, and about 181 skilled trades, or 55%. So of these trades, I'm gonna stand way back over here for this one. We've got 41 weavers, 22 shoemakers, 16 tailors, 9 carpenters, 6 wool combers, and wagon drivers, 5 breeches makers, 4 each of cutlers, gardeners, coopers, and miners, 3 each of cord wainers, ribbon weavers, bakers, blacksmiths, masons, flax dressers, bricklayers, 2 each of silversmiths, tanners, barbers, linen weavers, nailers, cabinet makers, and saddlers, and 1 each. Oh, graziers, butchers, cloth dressers, couriers, farmers, filesmiths, glass cutter, glazier, gun maker, harness maker, hatter, hosier, miller, musician, needle maker, painter, sawyer, spectral maker, stocking maker, stone, stone sawyer, surgeon, thatcher, tobacconist, fiddler, wheelwright, and wire drawer. So we have quite a range of different skills within the regiment. All right, well, how nice. They're all soldiers. What does this matter? Well, a British regiment is designed to be able to deploy overseas for extended periods of time and be able to operate reasonably independently when it needs to. British regiments were sent to places like Canada and Illinois and uh, Pensacola, Florida in the 1760s, and they needed to be there for extended periods. And then within the regiment, we've got, oh, we've got tailors, and we have shoemakers, and uh, britches makers, and a few other trades like this. We've got uh, somewhere in there, there's some people who have skill at leather work. We have blacksmiths, we have a gun maker. This works out pretty well for the regiment. It can maintain itself with all these trades it needs. When it's winter time and we need to build huts and go into barracks, gosh, we've got, we've got sawyers and we've got thatchers and we've got <coughs> bricklayers, people who can build fireplaces and chimneys and things that we need. So the regiment can take advantage of having these skills and sure enough, it did. Many British soldiers earned extra money over and above their base pay by doing military work at their trades that they had learned before joining the army, working for the army. In fact, it was extremely common for this to happen and it helped the regiment be an independent, deployable entity. 